Hello lovelies, today we're taking a look at Shadow of the Demon Lord, uh, which I constantly and consistently get confused with against the Dark Master, uh, which we've already looked at. Now, both have a similar kind of premise, the, uh, the, the tropey idea of the Sauron style um, existential threat to the to the future of a fantasy realm being very much in the ascendant and perhaps having essentially won and you playing heroes who are more morally grey and desperate than those that you might find in Tolkien fighting back against this now against the Dark Master um, has a system that is basically the old MERP system with the serial numbers filed off. Shadow of the Demon Lord has its own system and there are a few differences here and there. This is more of a renaissance style game, you know, there's, there's gunpowder and things things like that to, to consider uh, in Shadow of the Demon Lord. So it's a... What? 270-ish page book. Uh, I got the softback version printed from uh, drive through which means it was printed by Lightning Source, which means the print quality isn't uh, necessarily the best. Lightning Source's color interiors tend to be very flat, very bland, very washed out. You know, it's not a reflection on, on the work, on the book, or the art within it. It's just, this is what happens when you order from drive through Lulu's high quality color printing is a lot better, but also a lot more expensive. Um, though I would say that their basic printing is, is better than Lightning Source's basic color printing as well. But uh, your mileage may vary, but it's just something to be aware of if you're gonna be ordering hard copy from drive through and I complain about it every time. <laughs> uh, so yeah, like I said, it's your normal fantasy world except uh, a little bit more grimdark, a little bit more morally ambiguous, um, which is how I tend to like it. I tend to find games where moral systems are completely intractable to be dull and boring. If you try to make characters morally question what they're doing in, say, Warhammer 40,000 and its various RPG spin-offs, you're gonna have a bad time. If you try to do the same thing in a lot of fantasy games, you're gonna have a bad time. So it's nice to have a, a genuinely morally ambiguous game, though I understand how some people feel that the market is oversaturated with, with grim darkness these days um, and yet I will defend people who want to use alignments and so on because that's a that's a perfectly valid way to play it's just a matter of taste I thought I was gonna like this game a lot more than I actually do now in a lot of ways it is your basic bitch d20 system All right it's not a copy of Dungeons and Dragons, but it is roll a d20, add bonuses, you know, versus a, versus a target number, and and you succeed. As well as bonuses, it has its own version of the advantage um, mechanic called Boons and Banes. Each boon that you get, you roll a d6, and then you add the highest onto your d20 roll. Each bane you get, you roll a d6 take the highest and take it away from what you roll. Boons and Banes cancel each other out. If you have one of each, then you don't have any. So it's a little bit deeper than the advantage system in uh, in Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and if anyone was, was interested, the, um, the advantage and disadvantage system in D&D &D is basically the equivalent of adding or taking away three to four uh, from what you roll um, and so a d6 with an average score of 3.5 you know that's that's within that range so in play it should 
broadly feel kind of the same as Dungeons and Dragons in terms of advantage and disadvantage, boon and bane, um, but with a little bit extra depth in that you can have multiple boons, multiple banes in this system. Characters are created by overlaying a bunch of different templates which gives you your basic scores and all your stuff and your, and your basic skills. So your ancestry, yawn, uh, essentially your race gives you your base stats. So, you know, all humans are basically the same. All changelings, which is a nice addition, are basically the same. Um, all clockworks, uh, which are mechanical robots and golems, essentially, basically the same. You've also got dwarves, uh, goblins, because, you know, with the, the bad guy ascendant, there are rebel rebels within their ranks and so on. So, yeah, here it fits. Uh, orcs as well. Some of those have rebelled against their Dark Lord. So that gives you your basic races. And then on top of that, you overlay a template from a profession. So the professions include academic common criminal professions, martial professions, not too dissimilar to how the subcategorization within Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay uh, is laid out, possibly an influence on, on what we've got here. Um, and then you get your starting equipment and then you get to customize a little bit, but I feel like you don't get to customize enough. And so characters are going to end up feeling fairly samey especially if you're choosing the same sort of sort of starting path yeah if two people are playing a, a human fighting type it's gonna feel largely the same uh, under the hood though you might choose to use different weapons wear different armor and role play in a different way when it comes down to the mechanics they're going to feel very much the same and to me, that just doesn't feel good enough anymore. Um, I want more layers of customization. Now, to be fair, as you level up, you unlock more specialization. So the, the likelihood of having exactly the same path shrinks and your character becomes more customized. Um, and as you level, you can also customize your character that way. But starting characters have a real issue of, of looking and feeling the same. Now, even in you know your your old school D and D, you know if you're rolling three d six for th for stats, the likelihood that they're going to be the same <laughs> is quite small. So there's actually greater differentiation in bog standard D and D than there is in this. But you do get the customization as as you advance in level. Uh, otherwise, it, a lot of it is a lot of your standard ain't broke, don't fix it sort of way of looking at things. Um, conditions under a different name, hit points under a different name, weapons and so on all work pretty much how you'd expect. There is gunpowder in the setting, so there are pistols and rifles. That's a trend that I like in modern fantasy games, but some people dislike a great deal. Um, I just find the inclusion of those kind of weapons not to be game-breaking due to the you know, slowness to load, the problems with them exploding, <laughs> things like that. And it just becomes more interesting to me once you edge into that Renaissance and an early modern period uh, as exemplified in Anno Domini 1666 or my own Whitechester or Lamentations of the Flame Princess. It's just a more interesting and varied period to me, a, a time of great change that you don't see in a lot of fantasy worlds. They tend to stay the same for thousands of years without any real explanation as to why that might be. So yeah, um, after you've leveled up a bit, you will get to choose um, additional paths and, and abilities. So this is where you start to specialize and differentiate your character um, more than a, than a starting character. 
um, then expert paths carry that on to, to a greater extent. And yeah, this is where probably a lot of supplementary material can come in, offering new paths, modifications on paths, spins on paths, and so on. But I, I guess it's good that it gives you something to work towards uh, with your character, and finally feeling like you, you open that character out uh, into what you always wanted to be so there's there's goals there by not front-loading the character but I can see how it would be off-putting and it would be off-putting to me for the character to be, to be too generic at, at the front end and then only becoming what you want it to be later on in the campaign and with most campaigns not lasting very long <laughs> um, you know you're, you're not really going to get to that stage and yeah I'm running a lot of one shots recently and I'm not sure people would be satisfied with the level of character customization in a in a one shot but in a, I guess in a way it doesn't matter because you're not gonna play it for long so yeah uh, master paths is I think the highest level of, of specialization you can get and unlike a lot of games where you get kind of narrowed in to a specialization this game opens out, uh, so you get a lot more options as you advance and go go further. Um, being a D20 type system, you know, it's relatively easy to import and export things from other games, equipment and so on, and to reckon on the bonuses and so on that they give you. So all you really desperately need is, is the main book. You don't particularly need anything else the bones of the system are familiar enough to most people in, in most ways that it's relatively easy to add or, or take away whatever you want. Um, magic is fairly limited in some ways because it has certain paths and traditions that limit what kind of spells you can use and then you kind of work your way into those paths and unlock those spells. Um, it's not a massive comprehensive spell library but again it would be pretty easy for you to customize uh, things here and I tend to prefer a more a more limited and interpretive sort of magic in systems um, ever since I played Mage of the Ascension I've always preferred it that sort of way and you could take that kind of spin on what you find here but it's a, it's a lot of very thematic magic and the spells aren't enormous you know that they're, they're small workable descriptions uh, I've been reading DCC and MCC a lot and they're like whole pages for spells has been really <laughs> off-putting so that was that was nice to see um, we do get a background on the world it would kind of spoil things a little bit to go into into too much detail here it's always more fun to encounter the world um, and, and learn about it that way, it's probably more appropriate for characters as well in a pseudo-medieval setting where travel is rare. Uh, you probably wouldn't hear too much about other lands, and if you did, it would probably be wrong. <laughs> but uh, there's basically no corner of this land that is completely untouched uh, by the evil that has seeped in everywhere. Um, so there's plenty for you to fight, plenty for you to do, and there's an imperative because the darkness continues to, to spread. Games Master's tips and so on, a lot of it's fairly generic like most Games Master sections are. You know, it assumes for a lot of people that this might be their, their first RPG, which is probably an unsafe assumption for anything that isn't D&D these days. Um, but you know, it's it never hurts to have reminders um, and, and ideas on how things might work. And uh, the plot structures for, for tabletop RPGs is, is genuinely good advice that would be good for, for anyone, I think. Um, and it's advice for player characters, uh, which doesn't happen often enough um, and is something I think more games should have. It's a bit scant, but uh, that it's included is, is a nice thing. 
I think I did that in one of my games, but I can't remember which one. <laughs> it's like how to be a good games master, how to be a how to be a good player. I think we need more material that tells people how to be a good player with, without being intimidating. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean short. Um, so we have some tips and ideas for magical treasure, enchanted objects and so on, and a fairly nice bestiary, which isn't all your typical stuff. There's some interesting medieval animals. There's some other creatures. Um, there's some stuff that's typical, but there's enough stuff that isn't typical that it, it keeps it interesting. And there's nothing radically different about a lot of these things. But again, you know, that's that's fine. Um, but there are a lot of things that players aren't necessarily going to be familiar with on a, on a meta level, which helps keep combats and things fresh. Uh, there's a few peculiar influences in here as well. <gasps> Boobies. YouTube won't like that. Um, <laughs> uh, so you know, that, that keeps players on their toes when they don't quite know uh, what's going on. Um, and there's some truly outre things like uh, robotic enemies from another universe. That's definitely a gug with the serial numbers filed off. But there's nothing wrong with a bit of Lovecraftian horror and this sort of thing. Um, so this was reasonably popular and has a, a bit of support. Um, so there is supplementary material uh, if you if you feel that you want it, but it is standalone, um, easily enough for you to use. Has a nice comprehensive index, <sighs> but I didn't like it as much as I thought I was going to. And you would think that I would. Uh, being into my grim, dark, and morally ambiguous gaming, and so on, you know. Um, scores then. Style. So yeah, the the printing suffers, I think, but the layout's nice and clean and clear. And even though it's got a coloured background, yeah, it's not. It, it doesn't overwhelm the text. The art is probably better on a decent printing, but it's it's fine and it kind of blends into the background nicely. It's it's a workmanlike, more sort of technical manual style layout, which is great for an RPG. To be honest, it doesn't have to be all arty and and highfalutin. Um, you can get away without that. So yeah, it's not hugely artistic in its in its presentation, but it is effective. In its presentation, and I can't dock it points for the uh, for the printing because that's entirely down to Lightning Source. Stop using them, please. <laughs> um, so a high a high three, maybe a four, if I'm feeling generous uh, for style. In terms of substance, uh, definitely a, a solid four. Um, there's everything you need in here to run the game. It doesn't leave you needing more. My main problems with it are related to, to character creation and that the system is kind of generic. Um, yeah, we, we can do better, and especially for a, a grim and gritty setting, a flat D20 tends to give wild swings that are more suited to to a heroic game uh, whereas in you know instead substituting like 2d10 or something might work better um, so that's a kind of fundamental design decision that I that I disagree with for this game given the themes and so on that's that's probably brings the style downwards a bit more um, so let's call it three for style, four for substance then. So that's seven out of 10, three and a half out of five, above average. Um, a lot of people like it. Maybe they're seeing something I, I don't, or maybe this style of game is newer to them than it is to me. 
this is a, a, a solid entry, but there's nothing about it that really stands out and says, you know, I'm the one to get, I do something particularly well, right? But it's a, it's a solid system. Um, it's just nothing new. That, that's what really detracts from it, I think. Not that new is necessarily better. Um, well, that's enough conditions on my statement. I stand by my score. 7 out of 10, 3.5 out of 5. Zang. I very occasionally record podcasts, which you can find at anchor.fm slash Grimm's Tales.